Right, let's take our Bibles tonight and turn to the book of Judges again. Chapter 3. We're moving backwards in Judges, but we're just going to look at another judge tonight. A man named Ehud. There is a sermon I like to preach about Ehud called, I have a message from God for thee, but I'm not going to preach that sermon. We're just basically going to preach on the man tonight. I read a, a title one time of a sermon someone preached on uh, this subject. They called it, When Lefty Met Hefty. And I kind of like that title, so maybe I should steal that one. When Lefty Met Hefty. All right, Judges chapter 3, verse 12. It says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel, and possessed the city of palm trees. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, eighteen years. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gerar, and Benjaminite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. But Ehud made him a dagger, which had two edges of a cubit length, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. And he brought the present unto Eglon, the king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. Thus, when left he made hefty. Verse 18, And when he had made an end of the offer of the present, he sent away the people that bear the present, but he himself turned again from the queries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, Keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him, and Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat. And Ehud put forth his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the half went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly. And the dirt came out. Let's pray. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd be with me as I stand before your congregation tonight. I pray that you'd help me to stand in the power of the Spirit of God, and I pray that you'd teach me what I should say. And Lord, I pray that you'd take the Word of God preached, apply it to all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Now all the du duration of 400 years uh, covered by the book of Judges, the nation of Israel followed a very uh, predictable pattern. Uh, they would serve God faithfully and while they followed strong leadership by the judges. But when a judge died and they had no leader, uh, they would desert God. They'd turn their back on Him. And they'd begin to walk in disobedience uh, to His law give themselves over the, to the worship of pagan gods and to the, the worship of false gods of the Canaanites. And that's kind of the pattern today too, isn't it? Sometimes we have strong leadership and we do well, then we get bad leadership and we start to go away from God. And I tell you what, I see that pattern in Christians' lives. They serve God for a while, then they don't serve God until some kind of trouble comes. Then they talk, then they get back in relationship with God because they're in such a mess, and then they start the process over and over again. But anyways, uh, when uh, Israel rebelled against the Lord, He was sending judgment upon them uh, by allowing Israel to be oppressed by their enemies. After a time, Israel would call out to God again, and God would raise up another deliverer. God would use that person then to put Israel's uh, enemies to flight. And then once again we said the pattern. It would start all over again. And that's what we see here in the verses. Israel sinned against God and the Lord caused Eglon, the king of Moab, to become strong. Eglon invaded Israel with the help of the Ammonites and the Malachites. And together they oppressed Israel for 18 years. Eglon invaded Israel with the help uh, of these Amalekites and, and they, they, they uh, did a lot of harm to Israel until they called upon the Lord and the Lord raised up Ehud to deliver. And Ehud assassinated Eglon as we just read in our text today and won victory and freedom for the people of God. Now there's a lot to learn from this story if we'll just pay close attention to it. You want to pay close attention to it tonight? All right. 
Like Israel, we often follow that same pattern as I've already alluded to today. Uh, disobedience, chastisement, restoration. Disobedience, chastisement, restoration. When we see uh, the error of our ways. Our problem is not the Moabites or the Amorites or the Amalekites. Our problem that we face, our greatest enemy, is the old flesh. That place where your spirit lives. Uh, uh, the flesh is our greatest enemy. I've often said this from the pulpit. Your worst enemy is that person that stares at you when you look in a mirror. I hear people say sometimes, oh, the devil's just been after me this week. No, the truth of the matter is the devil don't even have to mess with you because you're your own worst enemy. As this text unfolds, we'll see that Israel's enemies are a clear type of our enemy, the flesh. Eglon's a perfect picture of the flesh, by the way. He's out of control and he's self-indulgent. That's why he's such a fat man. He's, he's given in to his own desires instead of what's right. Amen. That's what the flesh does. It wants us to give in to our own desires. It wants us to be self-indulgent instead of reaching out for what God wants for us. He's fat, he's lazy, he's evil, he's full of pride. He's also assassinated by Eglon. I mean by Ehud. Ehud and Eglon, well those names are too similar. But anyways, in Israel's defeat of Eglon, we see a picture of the battle that we're supposed to be fighting every single day. That battle we have with the flesh every morning that we wake up. Every one of us has problems with the flesh too. Sometimes we win the battle with the flesh, and sometimes we lose our battle with the flesh. Sometimes we don't even put up a fight. And sometimes the desires, and we give in to all the desires of the flesh, we just quit. You ever done that? Yeah, you have. We're, we're, we're literally in a fight for our spiritual lives every single day. And it's a fight that we got to win. It's a, tie, it's a fight that we have to conquer every single day. It's a fight that we always need to buckle on our armor uh, to do. This passage gives us help we need too, by the way, to fight and win that battle with the flesh. Tonight I'm going to preach to you about Ehud and Israel and their battle with Eglon. I want you to see how they won their battle with those that oppress them and how you can win your battle with the flesh. You don't have to, to, to be a slave to your fleshly desires. You, you can be free from the grip of sin. You can walk in victory. You uh, can fight the fight God's way. And let's see how. Now, first of all, let's talk about Israel's dilemma in our outline tonight. Verses 12 through 14 describe a horrible oppression that Israel suffered because of the rebellion against the Lord. Their problems stand as a warning to all those who would walk away from God. Let's look at these verses and learn from them. Let's, let's look at the foes that they faced because of this. Israel faced three nations because of their rebellion against God. They faced the Moabites. They faced the Ammonites. And they faced the Amalekites. All three of these nations were a continual problem uh, for Israel and all three were connected to Israel by blood too, by the way. Interesting enough. The Amalekites were descendants of Esau, Jacob's twin brother. The Moabites and the, the Ammonites were descendants from Lot and Abraham's nephew. After Lot and his daughters were delivered from Sodom and Gomorrah, Moab and Ammon were conceived through incest, if you know that story. All three of these nations worshipped false gods. The Moabites served a, a god called Shemosh, if I'm saying that right. I don't care if I'm saying it right or not. He don't deserve to have his name said right. The Ammonites worshipped a god called Moloch. And you've heard me mention Moloch before. Moloch was the, the god that they would sacrifice their children to. They, the, the false god had its hands out like this and they were, they were made of brass and there'd be a fire underneath and that fire would heat those hands and they'd lay their children in those hands and burn their children alive. And you may say, that's horrible and it certainly is, but how much more horrible is it? Uh, it's not any more horrible than it is for uh, mothers today to sacrifice their children uh, to abortion. On the altar of convenience. 
But both these gods were worshipped through vile sexual practices and child sacrifice too. The Amalekites uh, were a nomadic warlike group too who worshipped a variety of pagan gods. They had a whole pantheon of them. All three of these nations were a continual thorn in the side of Israel. They were constantly attacking, hindering, and seeking to enslave the people of God. These three nations are a picture of our old fleshly natures in this. Think of Moab. Moab represents the power of the flesh. Ammon represents the passion of the flesh. And Amalek uh, represents the persistence of the flesh. The flesh is powerful. It's so powerful it can separate us from fellowship with God. It is a thing of passion. A passion that is against what God would have us to do. And the flesh is certainly persistent. He's there every single day. That's why Paul said, I die daily. He has to kill the flesh every day because you kill him and he comes back to life the next day. Amen. Just like Israel was repeatedly attacked by these nations, the believer is continually attacked by the flesh. Our flesh has its own desires. It does not like the way of holiness nor the way of righteousness. The flesh likes the way of evil and the way of Satan. It wants to lead us away from God. Listen to Ephesians Chapter 2, verse 1, what it says. It says, You hath he quickened who are dead in your trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past, this was before you were saved, in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that now work in the children of disobedience. That's what you used to do. He says, Among whom we've all had our uh, conversation, that means our way of life, in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath even as others. We used to walk that way but since we've been born again we have the power to overcome that life. But when we give into the flesh we walk like we did before we were saved. That's a terrible thing, isn't it? That isn't becoming to the saint of God. We ought to live differently. We ought to stick out like a sore thumb. We ought to be a peculiar people. So we got to kill the flesh. The flesh that you and I carry around will do everything to try to ensnare us and get us back to that old way of life. It will prevent us from reaching our fullest potential in Christ. Don't you want to be everything you can be for God? You're going to have to kill the flesh. Don't be deceived. Your flesh hates God and everything God stands for. Your flesh will never submit to the Word of God. It must be forced into submission by a show of strong force. Here's how Paul described this enemy. In Romans chapter 7, verse 14, listen to what he says. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but the sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that is in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which was good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Paul's talking about that battle. He said, sometimes I just want to do right, then I do wrong. He says, sometimes I, 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 just, I, I just fail miserably. What's happening? What, what is, what's happening to Paul? Eglon's raised up. And he didn't kill him the way he should. He didn't fight the, the battle well enough. He didn't equip himself well. And I tell you, if Paul fell short, you can bank on it. You're going to fall short sometimes too. But I tell you, we need to do our best to fight this fight. Uh, let's look at the fights here. Not only the foes, but three nations joined forces and came against Israel. It, we're told that they smote Israel. Y'all know what being smote means. It means killed them. Drove them before them. 
These pagan armies didn't come for a friendly picnic with their picnic baskets to Israel's doors. No, they come to kill them. They came to destroy Israel. And Israel had to fight for the very existence. Uh, the, the battle we wake up to every day is serious just like that. I mean, our mortal bodies are not in danger here in our country right now, but our spiritual well-being is certainly at stake every single day. We need to suit up every day then and put on the whole armor of God. That helmet of salvation, that breastplate of righteousness, that, that belt, uh, the, 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 we need to gird our, gird our loins, have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. I usually can name all those really well. But anyways, put on the whole armor of God. We see their failures. Egalon established his headquarters in the city of Palms, according to the verses we just read. This is another name for Jericho, by the way. Uh, Jericho was the first city conquered by Israel when they entered into the promised land over in Joshua chapter 6. Jericho represented all the victories that God would give them in the future. But they had to follow the Lord. Do you think the walls of Jericho would have fell down if Israel had not followed what God said? Now, what if they just marched one time around there and they said, well, we don't need to do it seven times and seven times on that last day. We'll, we'll just do it one time. Now, what? You think the walls would have fell? No, they had to wholeheartedly follow it. They had to take it serious. We need to take this thing serious too. Uh, like... Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, it says, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. This is Paul talking about how to have victory over the flesh. He said, Lest by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should become a castaway. When he says I keep my body un under my body, he means I, I, I beat it back black and blue. Now he's not talking about his physical body. He's not hitting himself with whips like the the Catholics do. They call that. I'm trying to think of what the name of that is. It's, it's very close to another word I don't want to say up here. But anyways, uh, he's talking about it, his, his body. He's talking about his flesh. He fights it. He beats it black and blue. He has victory over it. If he lets the flesh have any occasion against him, he will go backwards instead of forwards. When the flesh rises up, we've got to put it back in its place. Beat it up. Punch it. Assault it. Deny it. Uh, make, uh, make it uh, toe the line for the glory of God. Amen. Are you following me? Now let's see their foolishness uh, uh, of, the, of the people of God here. Because Israel failed to honor the will of God in their walk day by day with the Lord, they became servants to Eglon. Servants to the flesh, if you want to follow my, my analogy. The word served means that they became a slave to Eglon. He wasn't a good king to them. No, he was, they were slaves to him. Israel had been redeemed. And they were servants of Jehovah, but because of their sin. Because they didn't, uh, they didn't put the, flight, the flesh, they didn't kill the flesh. They didn't serve God, now they serve pagan kings. And they were in that condition for 18 years. Sometimes it takes time for somebody to see how desperate the situation they put themselves in is. But they have a deliverer, I like that. The first point was uh, Israel had a dilemma, but they also had a deliverer. Their dilemma was they were servants to Eglon, but God gave them a deliverer when they crawled out for help. And God always helps you when you call out for Him. Now, that's where Israel finds itself here in the text. When they finally got tired of servitude, they called upon the name of the Lord. When he, and, and He began the process of bringing them back. The first step to restoration is to see where you are. If someone does not see where they are, they won't seek restoration. A lost sinner cannot be saved until they know they're lost. That's why we tell them all of sin and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. Before we give them the good news that they can be saved, they need to know that they're lost. And I, I think about the prodigal son here. The prodigal son took his inheritance early and he lived it up for a while with riotous living, didn't he? 
The Bible finally says he came to himself. He realized his condition. When he looked down into the hog slot and thought about taking a bite, he saw his condition and he said, I need to go back to my father. We need to see our condition. If we've let the flesh rise up and put us in servitude, we need to see where we're at. If we're not living up to being what we ought to be for God, we need to see it and acknowledge it and, and seek the Lord. Our nation needs to realize how far it's gone away from God that it can also seek repentance. We see the problem here. Uh, Ehud was part of the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin's allotment uh, included the area of Jericho. Thus, they would have suffered the most under Eglon. That's Ehud suffered a lot under Eglon. Ehud and the men of Benjamin had plenty of reasons for wanting the Eglon and his armies gone. We're also told that Ehud was a man left-handed. That's a very interesting phrase, and we find it in different places in the Bible. There seems to be a great number of men from the tribe of Benjamin, too, that were men left-handed. Now, many believe that when the Bible says a, a man left-handed, it doesn't simply imply that the guy's left-handed, like we got lefties and righties. Most people are right-handed. There's a few lefties. But the reason it calls it out, most people believe, and Bible scholars, I mean by that, they say that usually when it says that, it implies the person was crippled in their right hand. Uh, I don't know if that's the case for sure, but we'll just assume that here tonight. Uh, this would seem like a handicap for a would-be deliverer, wouldn't it? To have a crippled hand? Huh? I mean... That kind of sounds like God, don't it? When he needed somebody to go tell a Pharaoh to let his people go, who did he pick? Tongue-tied Moses. We preached about Gideon. When he wanted the Midianites gone, who did, he, who did he pick? A guy hiding, threshing a little bit of uh, wheat there in his cellar. When he wanted a giant knocked down, who did he pick? The mightiest? No. Did he pick the guy that was a head taller than everybody in King Saul? No. Pick the shepherd boy. When he wanted to spread his gospel and pick his uh, uh, apostles, he went down to pick some fishermen, the tax collector, some other folks. You see what God does? God takes those who are the meanest, and what I mean is the smallest, and uses them in a mighty way. And why does he do that? He does it so he can have the glory. He does that because a, a person that knows uh, what their limitations are will depend on God more instead of what they're good at. We all have some issue or another that we think hinders us from being uh, what the Lord would have us to be. Uh, we, well, we need to just stop making excuses and get busy for Him. Put ourselves in the Almighty's hand and great things will be done. We see his plan too. They probably didn't even uh, search Ehud here. They had nothing to fear, especially if they thought he was a crippled man. By the way, the flesh knows that you're crippled. The flesh knows you lack the power to overcome it on your own. The flesh thinks you're weak. It knows you're weak. The flesh uh, thinks it can control you and your life. And the flesh is right. But the flesh forgets one important truth. And that truth is found in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 where it says, My grace is sufficient for thee, and for my, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Your, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. See, a lot of times our, our best points work against us. I, I think about Peter. Peter the apostle had one of his strengths as he was outspoken, wasn't it? I mean, when, when the people were saying uh, Jesus is uh, Elijah come back or Jesus is that prophet, Jesus said, uh, who do you say? And Peter said, thou are the Son of God. He's outspoken, wasn't he? I mean, he was brash. I mean, when they came to take Jesus, he drew a sword and cut off the high priest's ear. When uh, Jesus was walking on the water, he spoke and said, Lord, uh, ask me to come out there to you. But where did Peter fail? 
He failed in the same area where he was strong, didn't he? I mean, he was bold. And he failed in boldness, denying that he knew the Lord even to a little maid. Huh? He was outspoken, but he wasn't outspoken that night. He said, I don't know the man. And there was a curse. Our strengths become liabilities a lot of times. We need to realize how weak we are. Because in his weakness... His, his strength is made perfect. I think about Philippians 4.13, and I love this verse. And it doesn't mean that you can do all things. I'm not going to flap my hands and fly up in the air. But I can overcome any temptation. I can overcome any a wile of the devil. Uh, uh, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. The flesh forgets that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The flesh forgets uh, that I've been saved and I don't have to sin. The, the, the prison door has been unlocked and I can walk out. Too bad some Christians choose to walk back in the cell even with the door unlocked. The flesh forgets that I've been delivered uh, from its power and that I can walk in victory and in the glory of God. After delivering the money to Eglon, the delegation departed here. After they had gone a short distance, Ehud came back and told Eglon, i got a secret message for you, Eglon. And those of you looking to have children, that did a good name. He'll call you your son Ehud or Eglon. But think about this in verses 20, 20 and 26. When uh, Ehud gets Eglon alone, uh, Ehud tells the king that he has a message from, for the king from God. Now, if God's got a message from you, you usually won't listen, don't you? Amen. And uh, Eglon stands up to hear the message. And Ehud reaches under his cloak to a, a dagger he has on his thigh and he thrusts it in the thrust it into Eglon's belly. And the blade sinks so fat, I mean so far, into uh, the king's body uh, that the fat encloses over the, the handle and Ehud can't pull it out. It's just something down in there. Not that it matters because Eglon is dead. He can't pull, if he pulled it out, he's going to die anyway. Ehud locks the doors uh, to the roo uh, rooftop room where they are and he makes his escape. And Eglon's servants find the doors locked and they think the king's using the bathroom. Which is what the phrase means there in verse 24. It says he covered his feet. His garments were over his feet. If you've ever walked past the stall in the public bathroom, you see what covering the feet is. But uh, they thought he was in the bathroom. Now this is gross. The Bible says that the dirt came out. That means his bowels emptied there in verse 22. So the, so the locked door and the odor from the chamber convinces the servants that the king's on the throne. And I don't mean the royal throne. Y'all supposed to laugh at that, by the way. Uh, they wait until they're literally embarrassed. If you read verse 25, they're thinking, should we go in? Should we not go in? He's in the bathroom. Maybe he's having a hard time. I, I don't know. Can you see them out there trying to figure out whether or not they should go in? I, I didn't see uh, Ehud come out. After a long time, they, they, they finally uh, retrieve a key and they enter into the chamber and they find the king dead on the floor. And by this time, Ehud's long gone. This is how you deal with the flesh. You kill it. Unlike Eglon, though the flesh will rise again, you know what you need to do? Kill it again. Every day we need to thrust the sword of God's Word into the flesh. The best thing you can do in the morning is open this book right here. Best thing you can do in the morning is open this book. And also, by the way, when you lift your eyes, talk to God. You start, can start the day off right. It's hard to start off wrong when you got the Word of God in you. It's hard to start off the day wrong when the Word of God, when, when prayer is on your mind. And we see lastly, Israel's final deliverance here in verses 27 through 30. It involved following and leading. And I thought that's very important in churches. Following and leading. 
We follow. We don't always lead. Even those of us who are considered leaders don't always lead. Sometimes we got to be led by, well, we always got to be led by the great shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you got to be able to follow. I mean, you shouldn't always want to be the top dog. If you want to be the top dog all the time, you should never be the top dog. Amen. The person that's the leader is the one who really don't want to be the leader, but they see the necessity of it, so they do it. Not the person who really wants it. You following me? Some people just seek an office or a title. We shouldn't be seeking offices or titles. Uh, that's just getting the applause of men and accolades of men. What we want to be servants. Paul, when he addressed the churches, he didn't say, I am the mighty Paul, the apostle. I am the one who's in charge of all of you. I am the illustrious potentate of the churches. No, he starts out saying, Paul, the servant, not the bond slave. Uh, when he had returned from killing Eglon, he sounded the ram's horn. The trumpets were sounded for several reasons in Israel. First of all, they were blown to announce a feat that was done. Uh, they were also blown to signal a change of location. We're moving. An army would mo have certain blasts for movement. By the way, one of these days I'm going to hear a blast in the clouds and I'm going to be moving too. Amen. Making a great move. They are also blown to demonstrate uh, joy and to praise the Lord. But most of the time when they were blown it was because it was to call people to war. An army was present. Me and Sharon was talking about that uh, last week. Uh, when they blowed all them trumpets around and broke the, the pitchers. They probably thought there was a bunch of armies coming down on them. But anyways, he's blowing the horn of war right here. That's his purpose. And I, like Ehud, want to blow the trumpet tonight. It's time for war. It's time for us to murder the flesh. Now, I'm not talking about Jim Jones here or the Kool-Aid cult killing your body. No, I'm talking about killing the old nature, the old man. Put him to death today. And then tomorrow when he gets up, you put him to death again and bury him deep. Amen. It involves fighting. And I tell you, we need to be able to fight. We don't just need to give in. A lot of times we're just blown to and fro by the flesh. We need to fight against it. Don't just give in. When you're tempted to sin, don't just go right with it. Fight it. Israel uh, cut off the avenues of escape uh, whereby the means of reinforcements would come after e Ehud killed Eglon. And then they killed about 10,000 men in this battle. The, the men uh, they killed were lusty, it calls them here in the scriptures. That means they were robust. It was mean they were menly men. By the way, we need some menly men too, by the way, just on a little side rabbit trail right there. Amen? We need a resurgence of manlyhood. Amen? We need some of that toxic masculinity. I'll take some of that. Amen? But anyways, uh, they, they, they fought these lusty men, these uh, robust men, these manly men, and they put them all to flight because they were doing what the Lord wanted them to do. Regardless of the power of these men and their military ability, they were defeated by, by Israel because God gave the victory to Israel. And God can give you the victory too. You say, all this sin's bugged me my whole life. I guess I'll just have to live with it. No. You can have victory over it. And then lastly, it involved finishing. I like what Paul said at the end of his life. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. I see a lot of people, they start out well, but they don't finish well. You ought to want to finish well. When you get older, don't say, I put my time in. No, you ain't put your time in until they lower that body of yours down in the ground. And you've done flown into heaven. It's like Brother Rick said, after we sung little as much, there's places to fight at. I mean, if your body's not physically capable of doing some things, there are things you can do. You can pray. You can encourage. There's things you can do. Find out what those things are and do them. Finish the fight. It says here in verse 29, they escaped not a man. I mean, they got them all. They wiped out all of Eglon's army. Israel did not back off till all the enemies were put to the sword. It was total victory over the enemy. We uh, are to live every day 
putting down every enemy. We shouldn't have some pet sin we allow to hang around. We need to put it to death too. We should be like it says over in Jude 1.23. It says, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. And then in closing, we all have problems with the flesh. It's overindulgent. It's self-assured. It's out of control like Eglon. This message is a call for us uh, to take the battle to the flesh. Blow the trumpet. Thrust in the dagger of God's word. Go to, to go, take it to the mattresses. Amen. We're a lot like Ehud. We're unlikely conquerors. We're crippled in one way or the other. We're weak. We are prone to spiritual failure. But like Ehud, we can walk in victory. All we need to do is take the word of God, our dagger, and hide it in our hearts. And assassinate the flesh every day as we pray.